We turn again this morning to Matthew's Gospel, (coughs) to the passage we read, so that we can continue our studies that we've already started. It doesn't seem to be a very promising passage. And yet there is a great sense in which if we don't study it together, we might know the Gospel, we might know the story in its essence, but we won't know the Gospel story as we say according to Matthew. For if you were to read in Luke and Mark, they proceed from Jesus' prediction of his own death, which in the verses immediately preceding verse 24, and then go on as in in chapter 18 to the question of who's the greatest amongst the disciples. And it's Matthew alone that draws our attention to these verses, to this incident. And perhaps it's because it takes place in Capernaum, which is the town he was from, and involved the lake that he was so familiar with, and perhaps even fished there as a boy, remembering the very first fish that he he himself caught, which didn't have a four drachma coin in it, but especially, I think, because it has to do with tax. And that was Matthew's own employment before Jesus called him to be one of his own disciples. It's the incident that he himself relates in chapter 9 and verse 9. And the whole area of Jesus paying his tax was of some interest to Matthew. Because it confirmed to him and to Peter and to the other disciples the faith declared in chapter 16 that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God and it confirmed too the nature of the one who was transfigured just earlier on in this chapter 17. As a matter of interest and I think apposite to the emphasis Matthew brings in his own gospel at this point was something that took place at our Bible study on Wednesday. We happened to be reading through the notes which intimated that there, were, there was an infection that was spreading into the church. And it was something that we all understood and all knew about, but it was a surgeon who told us that there were two types of infection. There was an infection that invaded the body and took hold very quickly. There was another kind of infection that took much longer to take effect in the whole system. Now, of course, all of us who were there had had at least some time in our lives an infection. But it was the surgeon, the doctor, who pointed out the different kinds of infections that we were unaware of, perhaps, until it was pointed out to us. And unless Matthew pointed out this incident concerning Jesus paying his tax, we might ourselves have overlooked it. But there was something he wanted us to see. And indeed, when we were applying at our Bible study, what we were learning to our own lives, those of us who were business persons applied what we were learning in business, teachers to teaching, parents in raising children, and so on. We appreciated what was happening and what God was teaching from our own lives. And Matthew brings us to this incident of Jesus paying his tax. You see, Peter was asked in verse 24, does your teacher pay his taxes? Now, I'm not quite sure how to put expression into that question, whether it was a polite aside to Peter, excuse me, we were just wondering whether Jesus paid his taxes or whether for some reason he was exempt, for there were certain clauses of exemption or whether people in Jesus' day were wanting again to find some way to accuse Jesus, perhaps not addressing Jesus himself, but in a loud stage whisper to Peter, oh, I see your teacher doesn't pay his taxes then. But Peter affirms that as Jesus had done so in the past, so he would, even in this present situation, pay his taxes. But it left an enormous number of questions in Peter's mind. Perhaps you noted that as we were reading through. 
For as he came into the house, Jesus anticipated all the questions that Peter had in his mind. Now we're not told what the questions were, but Jesus knew all that was going on in Peter's mind and was the first to speak. He anticipated those questions that Peter had concerning his paying tax. And it's all the questions that were, would arise to us if we knew the Old Testament teaching concerning temple tax and if it had penetrated into our consciousness as it had done for Peter in the transfiguration who Jesus really was. And we would think all those questions ourselves. And in order to answer these unspoken questions, Jesus tells a parable and he works a miracle. Or, or better, he works a sign as to who he was. And in these ways intimates to us the whole point and the lessons that we have to draw. But again, we need to see what Matthew is doing. He's wanting to bring to us this incident to confirm faith in a way that made sense to himself. So in the first place then, what was the parable that Jesus told? You're all familiar with the idea that a parable is an earthly story with a spiritual meaning. And the one Jesus told was very simple. In verse 25, what do you think, Simon, he asked? From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own sons or from others? Think of all the earthly kingdoms that you know and perhaps our own land ourselves. When an earthly king is wanting to exact taxes or to get his customs and excise duties, from whom does he require them? He wouldn't require them from any of the members of the royal family, would he? He would exact them from the citizens of the country in which he was ruling or from the strangers who were coming in for trading purposes. The sons of the royal family and the daughters of the royal family would be exempt from paying their taxes because they were royal. And if we transfer that into the kingdom of God and in Old Testament terms, from our Old Testament in Exodus chapter 30 from verse 11, God required of all Israelites from the age of 20 over to pay an annual tax for the upkeep of the temple. It was this two drachma tax that Jesus was required to pay here. And it was exacted for, from all for the atonement of their souls. Some were exempted from the tax for different reasons and perhaps the question in verse 24 was exactly that question. Does Jesus in so, is Jesus in some way exempt from paying his tax? And when Peter is asked, does Jesus pay? He says, yes. And yet, the sons are free. And didn't God already in chapter 17 say, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. He is the son of the king and the son of the royal family and he should go free. And Jesus says of himself, confirming all, all that had been said up to this point in the Gospel, that far from being just one of the Israelites, he was the son of the king. And that's the whole point of the parable that Jesus tells. From whom do the kings of the earth collect duties and taxes? From their own sons or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the sons are free. More than simply exempt. It wasn't that they re reaped all the benefits of the kingdom and salvation. 
It was that in that house they were free. They were at liberty. And all the atonement and ransom had nothing to do with Jesus, you see. Because he was the son of the king. So on from the parable, Jesus works a sign for Peter to see, which we read from in verse 27. Again, in an astonishing fashion, Jesus demonstrates his deity. He was Peter coming into the house and he hadn't even spoken a word. And Jesus knew all the questions that were in his mind, everything that he was going to say, and he answers them. Before a word is on my lips, O Lord, you know it all. And here was Jesus going on from that remarkable understanding of all that was going on in Peter's mind to demonstrate again his deity over the whole of creation even from fish. Do you see what Jesus said? Go and go to the lake and throw out your line. Go to the lake, Peter, because you're going to catch something immediately. And if you've ever done any kind of fishing at all with a hook, you'll know that we're not always successful at all throughout the whole day, and certainly not immediately. But Peter says, But Jesus says to Peter, go to the lake, cast in your hook, and immediately you'll get a fish. And it was the first fish that you catch. You don't have to wait there the whole day, hopefully trying to get something, but never quite sure. And when he pulled it out, he was going to find that exact amount of money, exactly to their requirements. And it was to be found in his mouth and Peter went and did all of it and found out exactly as Jesus had said. So Jesus paid his tax and demonstrated again underlining who he was. And that's the whole point of this incident. The Son is free. And Jesus, as the Christ, the Son of the living God, again demonstrated who he was. As God created everything, Jesus demonstrated his authority over the whole of nature. And we see again in this incident that as was the Father, so was the Son. What the Father does, the Son does. All that the Father has, the Son has. In his authority, in his understanding. And just as he was the Son of God and yet distinct, here was one who was greater than the temple, from whom the temple tax was paid not because he needed to pay it for the redemption of his own soul, but by concession. He didn't need to pay his tax because he was the Son of God. He demonstrated his authority over nature because he was the Son of God. And Jesus in this was aware of his own sonship. Jesus knew who he was, knew the freedom he had in his Father's house even from the age of 12. And among his disciples, among all the people, he demonstrated his authority. Jesus Christ, in the Father's house, has perfect freedom. But then the two questions that really do arise from this passage we need to answer are, why did Jesus then pay his tax? If he knew that he was free and born free as the, son, as the king's son, why did he pay his tax? And the second question that arises is, if Jesus was free, how did he use his freedom? 
because the lessons that we see in Jesus' life and his own use of the freedom that he was born with should be the example of the way as adopted sons and daughters of the living God who inherit all the benefits of the gospel, we should use our freedom too. So why then did Jesus, who was born free as the king's son, pay his tax? Verse 27 so that we may not offend them. Jesus knew who he was. Jesus knew that he was heir to all things. But he was considerate of other people. He was considerate of all those around about him with whom he lived and out of consideration for them in their ignorance, in their lack of understanding, in order not to offend them and to cause them to stumble, Jesus paid his tax. Now if you were to refer back to Exodus chapter 30 from verse 13, you would see that the temple tax was exacted of every Israelite over the age of 20 so that they would confess the Lord as their Redeemer. That they would confess the Lord as their King. And don't we sing in that lovely hymn, Glory, Lord and Honour to Thee, Redeemer King. And here was the Redeemer King out of consideration for other people paying his taxes because he was sent into this world born of woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law even as a baby his parents paid his dues and as an adult he paid for himself because he had already taught that not one jot or tittle of the law would pass away and he was determined in his own life of faith to keep all the requirements of God upon his people. Keeping that law perfectly so that everybody could see even though he knew he was free because he was born into this world bearing our human flesh so that he could be there in the likeness of sinners he paid the redemption price for himself even though there was nothing about his life that needed to be atoned because one day he would pay that exact redemption price once for all, for all of God's people, so that we could inherit freedom. You see, the only thing that bound Jesus to pay that temple tax was his own free will, was his own self-giving, for the sake of his people. And here was Jesus walking around Judean hills into Galilee. And such was his self-emptying as the Son born free. But he was considered as one of the crowd, as one who ought to pay his tax, because he humbled himself to bear the likeness of sinners, paid that temple tax for the redemption of his soul because one day he would pay that redemption price for every one of us. But he also paid that temple tax to prove that he wasn't indifferent to the temple and all that it stood for. Because God himself had given that way of atonement. 
that holy of holies where the priest would meet with God once a year. God had given the whole of the temple and its rites and rituals so that we could be free, liberated into that freedom and the grace of God brought it to us and Jesus wasn't indifferent to that temple. And perhaps if, if you have studied God's word and seen the way the temple and everything about it is fulfilled in the New Testament. Jesus was that lamb. Jesus was that priest. Jesus entered into the holiest place with his own blood. Jesus Christ himself is that mercy seat by which we come to God, everything about it, Jesus wasn't indifferent to. And Matthew points out that Jesus paid his tax so that we might see the importance Jesus attached to the temple. But Jesus also paid his tax to give to us an example. The same word is used in Romans chapter 13, render to everyone his due tax to whom taxes are due. <coughs> and we pay freely as Jesus himself, Jesus himself freely paid. So Jesus paid his temple tax not to cause offence, but to show his likeness to human sinfulness so that he wasn't indifferent to the temple and to give to us an example too that we should follow. But do you notice in the last place this morning how Jesus used his freedom and therefore how we ought to use our freedom? He knew exactly who he was. He knew exactly all the rights and the privileges of sonship, born free. But he freely served. He gave up all of his rights. He denied himself in order that he could give himself for his people. Freedom, you see, wasn't seen in a secular kind of sense that we can do whatever we please for ourselves at whatever time we like, to live our lives as we please. Because Jesus, in his use of freedom, showed that it wasn't simply unfettered power to direct our lives as we please, as we choose. Indeed, the way in which Jesus lived his life in perfect freedom was an evidence of the Holy Spirit's presence in his own soul. And as Jesus himself taught in John chapter 8, that true freedom was the fruit of truth in the inner man. The truth shall set you free. And Jesus went about his life in that self-humbling, knowing his freedom, using it for other people, using it to the glory of God, demonstrating the Spirit's presence in his own soul. And isn't it the case with ourselves as we have been liberated, been born as sons, and daughters of the living God adopted into his family, that we have brought to ourselves not the old law of sin and death with its accusation, but the law of freedom, the law of the Spirit of Christ, the, the new way of life brought to us as God's own people, as those who have been born into freedom, for freedom, Freedom Christ has set us free. But it liberates us into a newness of life which demonstrates the Holy Spirit within our own souls, the spirit of holiness in our lives, that we live as new creatures, 
that we live as sons of God as he originally intended. It's not a freedom to go on living exactly as we please, unrepentant, forgetting our sinfulness, overlooking sin, but walking with God, before God, with all the benefits of believers, into that freedom and liberty whereby we freely give ourselves to God and live in a way that pleases Him, live in a way that honours Him, live in a way that demonstrates the presence of that Spirit of holiness because it's the Spirit of Christ within our own souls that is the law of freedom. In a unique way, Jesus was born as a son in the family of God, in the King's house. But we have, by Christ and by adoption, inherited that freedom. Let's use the freedom and the liberty that we have to glorify God in our bodies. Thankful to God for Him. Let's pray together. Our blessed Lord, we give you thanks for our Saviour who is the eternal Son of God, the one who is heir to all things and free in the house of God. We bless you that he used his freedom so that we might be redeemed. He used his freedom so that he could freely give himself to your will and to live in a way that always Please, the Father, grant that as your sons and daughters, heirs and joint heirs with Christ, by reason of your grace, that we would inherit that increased freedom and liberty and joy of your household. Enable us to live empowered by your Holy Spirit with that law of freedom, in holiness of life and living, in mind and thought, to your praise and glory. Amen.